Well, we've come to the last question in the uh, larger, cate- I mean, the shorter catechism, in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We've been at this for over two and a half years now. And in the last part of the catechism, of course, we have been looking at the subject of the means of grace. That is, at the means that God uses to connect us with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we have life. The inward means are faith and repentance by which He enables us to come to Christ for forgiveness and new life. By faith, we were under God's, we realize that we were under God's condemnation and we depend on Him as the one that God the Father sent to restore us to Himself, going to the cross in order to ransom us from our sins. And then repentance. By repentance, we turn from our old life that was cut off from God in order that we may follow Christ who leads us in the Father's ways, giving us new life forever. So those are the inward means. What are the outward means? Well, the word, sacraments, and prayer. I mentioned those this morning. The preaching of the word, especially the reading of the word and sacraments and prayer. The primary outward means are these. With the word, God tells us how he sent Christ to redeem sinners. And he promises in his word to redeem us if we trust in him. And he gives us his commandments so that we will know how to live for him when we have come to him. And to convict us of our sins when we're before we have come to him. Also even after but. With the sacraments, he points us to Christ as the one who washes us. So that when we are baptized, we're we're saying that we're looking to him to to wash away our guilt and our corruption so that we might serve him as he has promised to do through Jesus Christ. And with the Lord's Supper, we're coming to look to him to nourish us. We've been through all of these. And then the last means of grace that we've been looking at recently is prayer. And we've been doing that for a while. By prayer, we come to God and we connect with Him, asking Him to give us grace, and He answers our prayers. And we see in the Word what we need. We see in the sacraments what is set forth to us. And then we cry out to God to give us these things in in ourselves and others. And He does. Now, most recently, we've been studying about, in particular, the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus taught us things that we need to pray for. We've seen that the desires that we bring to God are supposed to be desires in our prayers, are supposed to be desires that are according to His will. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gave us things that are according to God's will that we can confidently pray for. We've seen that the Lord's Prayer is a kind of a summary, that it covers a whole range of things that we pray for. And uh, of course, we've been through, we began with the preface where uh, it's our Father in Heaven, And we learn that we're to approach God as the one who is a loving Father that is desirous to do us good. We approach Him with that that, that, uh, understanding of of a Father. And at the same time, is the one who is in heaven that is able to do whatever He pleases. So that we come to Him knowing that He's not just a Father that wants to help us, but He's a Father that also has all power to help us. So what a great start to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven. And then we looked at the various um, petitions, the six petitions that follow the preface to the Lord's Prayer. Cover matters about which we're to pray. That God's name would be hallowed. That's where we need to start. The glory of God. We want to see Him honored. Because that's how we're blessed. We've talked about that in the morning uh, sermons lately. That with Jesus Christ coming back. What's so wonderful about that is that we see our Master, our King, our Lord, our Husband. We see Him honored. And then that brings us great joy and delight. This is something we should earnestly desire. We pray for God's kingdom to come. That is, for people to be gathered into Christ's kingdom of salvation and for Satan's kingdom to be overrun and destroyed as Christ's kingdom goes forth in the world. It's going to be accomplished. He's going to bring His kingdom. And we pray that earnestly before God. And then for His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven where where we yearn to see obedience to God full obedience from the heart, and that's going to be fully accomplished. The whole earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, 
and we're going to do the will of God. We're going to be changed. The, the whole world is going to be changed. The wicked are going to be cast out in the day of judgment, and our, we're going to be brought together with, with perfected hearts, raised from the dead to live and do the will of God. But we desire to see that more and more progressively. And then we pray for God to provide for our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread, the daily portion of what we have, what we need in this life what is right for us, what is suited for us to serve God in the world. And then we pray that God would forgive our sins. We talked about this last part. People talk about the sinner's prayer. Well, here we pray for God continually as God's people. We are still sinners. And we pray that our daily sins would be forgiven and that we would forgive others. We, we, uh, as we forgive others, as if we have tasted of God's forgiveness, then we have a heart that is ready to forgive the people around us, rather than to live in bitterness and, and, and resentment and hostility. And then finally, we've seen that we're to pray, the other part of the sinner's prayer, that to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We know that we're, we're subject to sin. We're drawn away very easily, drawn away from our Lord. We don't want to go away from Him, like Paul said in Romans 7. So we say, Lord, don't even tempt me. Don't lead me into temptation. And yet we know that in His sovereignty, He does lead us into temptation. So we also pray that he would deliver us from evil, that when the temptation comes, that it wouldn't take hold of us, and that if it does take hold of us, that we wouldn't stay in it, that he would bring us out. Now today we come to the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer. This is found in Matthew 6, 13. Some of you may have it in the margin of your Bibles, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But it reads as follows. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this again is the last question in the Catechism, question 107. It speaks about this, and uh, so let's confess the answer to this question together as God's people. Question 107. What doth the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, which is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen teacheth us to take our encouragement in prayer from God only and in our prayers to praise Him, ascribing kingdom, power, and glory to Him and in testimony of our desire and assurance to be heard, we say, Amen. Now, what does it mean here by taking, when it says taking our encouragement in prayer from God only? Well, it means that you recognize that no one else can answer your prayers but God. We don't go and asking other people to do so. Now other people, of course, have certain power in the world that God has given them, and they can do certain things that God has given them liberty to do, but ultimately they can't do anything unless God enables them. So he's the one that decides everything that happens. And seeing that, you're to pray to him upon whom all depends, because as if all depends on him, because it does depend on him. And because this is so, you're to praise Him as the one upon whom everything depends. We, we will look at what it means that His is the kingdom and the power and the glory in a lot more detail uh, as we move on in this message. And then a third thing here is that we look at how we use the word amen here to testify in our prayers to God that we want Him to do the things that we are asking Him to do. It's like an affirmation of that and that we know that He hears us. And so we, we close it out with Amen. We'll be looking at that in more detail as well. So in considering this conclusion, I want you to consider in the first place that this is a very fitting conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. But does it belong in our Bibles? Because some of you don't have it in your Bibles. If you have an uh, English Standard Version, for example, it's not there. It's in the margin. It's not in some of your Bibles because it's not in some of the oldest manuscripts of the Bible. It's in most of them, but it's not in all of them. There are a few passages in the Bible like this, so it bears saying something about this. As you know, when the Bible was written, they didn't have printing presses. So every Bible was written by hand. That means that sometimes mistakes were made, and of course they are with printing presses too, but mistakes were made when they were copying them. And then a copy that had that mistake in it would be taken to another place. Maybe it would be carried off to India or something by someone that was going there as a missionary. And then they would maybe use that to translate the Bible or, or to write it in the language of people that knew 
uh, the, the language that was written in, and it would be those mistakes would be copied, and then there would be propagated those those errors that were there again and again in the various copies that were made from the copy that was uh, had the mistake in it. Now it's easy to see how that even a whole sentence or even a whole passage could be left out or added. It could be left out if a copy you were taking had a missing page in it, for example. Or if a person doing a copy skipped something, which, uh, as you know, it's very easy to do. Like, they would sometimes, they would dictate sometimes with having several people copying, and maybe the person that was dictating would, would skip over something by accident. So then something would be left out in all those copies that were maybe spread around. Something could be also added deliberately, not in a malicious way, but someone was adding something maybe as a marginal note or an explanation of something, and then later on it could become standard in future copies, that just a part of the text that everybody was familiar with and just became integrated so that it would be in some of the manuscripts and not in others. Now, what is remarkable in all this, and what's very important for us to understand, is that how God shows His gracious hand of providence in all of these things in preserving the text of the Bible for us. We need to understand that there are these variations, but the, the matter is that they, they are very insignificant. First of all, it's remarkable that there are so few variations compared to other ancient texts that we have, even just a novel or something that are, are ancient, there, the things that are written, there are histories that are written, there, there are very significant variations and mistakes. The Bible is extraordinary in how much we have the uh, original uh, text. The copyists were very careful. But perhaps even more remarkable is the fact that there are no variations in the text that would either add to or contradict anything in the Bible. Now, of course, there are such variations found in some perverse copies where someone was trying to manipulate something, trying to tamper with the text in some way. But these are such oddballs compared to all the others that they're obviously ones that were maliciously drawn and are discarded because how could this one over here have something that none of the others have? It's very easy to to sort out those kind of things. So these variations were not, that, that were signi any significant doctrinal variations are not widespread. They're, they're not, which traces, when you have them in all different parts of the world and you trace them all back to the common source, you have one with, say, some significant variation, you know that it's no good. And all these other ones are blended in together to give us confidence that what we have before us is the Word of God that's been preserved. There are two reasons that we can be confident, in particular, that we have the true Word of God today. First, because God promised that He would preserve His Word. And so we trust Him in His sovereignty, in providence, as He works it out, that He does safeguard the Scripture. He has a special care about preserving of His Word to keep it from being corrupt so that we can be confident that today we still have the truth. And the second reason we can be confident is because we can see, as I was just describing, that it has not been corrupted. When we looked at these manuscript copies all over the world, we can see the minor variations, but we can also see that there are no major variations. And that gives you great confidence. You know, again, if you have from all different places and they're all the same, that they go back to an original ancient source. You can't possibly have something that started over here and then go over this way. When they all come out like branches of a tree, they all go back to a common source that we can be very, very confident about. So uh, those copying the Bible, again, you know, we're, we're, we're careful. So, so what can we say then about this particular variation in the Lord's Prayer? It's found in some manuscript families but not in others. What is it in the, is it in the original or not? Well, some Bible versions, again, tend to, like, like the English Standard Bible, for instance, uh, tend to favor the older manuscripts. And others, like the New King James that I read from, 
uh, tends to favor the majority of manuscripts that we have. I, I prefer that, uh, that focus. But the reason for looking at the majority is that these represent the ones that were copied the most. While some of the manuscripts that are older may in fact be inferior, and sometimes they show signs of being inferior because they were not used. They weren't worn out. That's why they're so old. If you copied something a whole lot, then it's like you have all these branches that if they're all similar and all the same, they point very clearly back to a, a much more ancient source. And so you can find a branch that's very, very true. Whereas if you just have that old one and no one copied it, then it's not, as, uh, it's not necessarily as reliable, even though it might be dated older. But uh, it's a very complicated science, and I'm certainly not any expert on this. But the thing that you need to keep in mind, and what's important for you to know as God's people, is that these variations are very small, and that they're very insignificant. And you know, if you put two Bibles beside each other, even that are based on different families, like the, um, the English Standard Version and the New American Standard, or, or the, uh, the, the New King James, you can look at them side by side. And there's very, very little difference of any significance. Most of it is translation differences where really the same thing is being said. So we're very, very thankful that we have God's word. But what with this conclusion then? So some of them have it, some of them don't. It seems likely that it was added to the original text that Matthew wrote with his hand. But very early on. You see, we have manuscript evidence that this conclusion was definitely used from some ancient writings in the church in the prayers of the church all the way back to the first century. And so we have clear evidence that it, it was present in some manuscript. And that means that it likely was inserted, like I was talking about before, as a marginal reading. You know, they didn't exactly have margins like we do always, and so you know, they didn't have a lot of room because they were using all the paper or the vellum or whatever that they were writing on, the parchment or whatever it was called. But perhaps it was, um, it was a bracketed thing, and then it became part of the text. But under God's providence, this could even be seen as something that the Holy Spirit deliberately added for future ages. And this is something I want you to think about, just as you think about this whole thing. The Holy Spirit was not limited by only what the first author wrote. Have you ever thought about that? When the Holy Spirit was giving us the inspired word of God, there could be later things that were written while we, the, the Bible was still under inspiration, when the Spirit was still working that way. For example, when the first copies of Deuteronomy were written by Moses, there were some things, such as the record of Moses' death, that Moses didn't write, unless he wrote it by prophecy, and we have no indication that he did that. So Moses, we know, wrote the Pentateuch, but... He didn't write all of it, some of those particular things. There are notes and things that are added that reflect later time. Those things were added by a person who was also working under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they became part of the Holy Scriptures that God has given us today in our standard Bible. There would have been a time when you would have had copies that were written from the hand of Moses, and then you would have other copies that were written from the hand of, say, Ezra or someone who could write under inspiration, and he would have these things like Moses' death added on to it. So you could, you could find versions that were made straight from Moses' copies and ones that were made from the ones that Ezra did. Ezra's became the standard ones that the Holy Spirit has given us as the Word of God. So I, I hope that helps. Same thing with the Psalms. We have the Psalms. You know how the Psalms are divided into five different books. Well, those five different books, um, at the end of each of those, the, the last Psalm in each of those five books has a benediction attached to it that wasn't part of the original Psalm. So, for example, Psalm 41, Psalm 72, Psalm 89, Psalm 106 all have these, these additions at the end of them. And the Holy Spirit has given us those through the one that brought together all the Psalms, compiled them by the Holy Spirit's guidance into a book, a collection of the 150 that we have today, and added these particular benedictions. There's, there's four of them because there's not one on, at the very end in the, in the fifth book. In fact, Psalm 150 is sort of a, a benediction to all the Psalms, but it was uh, not one that was added later. 
So we cannot say for sure that the Holy Spirit authoritatively added the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer, but we can say for sure that in God's providence, he allowed it to be added very widely and very early. And that's what matters. What is perhaps even more important than that is that we can say that this variation is true according to the analogy of Scripture. What I mean by that? Well, it's a suitable way for us to conclude our prayers because we can find it elsewhere in Scripture. We find the essential content of what we have in the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer in David's prayer in 1 Samuel 29 that uh, we read earlier in our uh, Old Testament Scripture reading. I'm going to be looking at, um, at, at 1 Chronicles 29 a little bit as we, as we go on here. So it enables us to say with confidence that the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer contains sentiments or thoughts or whatever you want to say that we ought to have, prayers that we ought to have, to boost our confidence when we're praying. Okay? Look at how David, who spoke by the Spirit of Christ, used the same truths that we have in the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, plus some other ones that he had, uh, about God's kingdom, power, and glory as an encouragement to his own prayers in 1 Chronicles 29. When David prayed this prayer that we, in, in 1 Chronicles 29, he was at a time of, of a tr important transition. Looking back, he saw how God had raised up the kingdom of Israel just as he had promised, when it looked impossible. I mean, Abraham couldn't even have a baby when these promises were first made. He, his wife was barren. And through all the things that had happened, God had brought them forth as a people. David knew that everything from the deliverance out of Egypt to their complete conquest of Canaan to their preservation from sin and idolatry that kept trying to swallow them up as God's people was all because of God's almighty power. He could see that looking back. It was God's kingdom by God's power for God's glory. David knew that. If you look at 1 Chronicles 29, you can see those three things. Kingdom, power, and glory. Okay, in verse 10 and 11, you can see those plus more. Therefore David blessed the Lord before the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. There's the forever part. Your kingdom, power, and glory forever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness. There's ones he adds. The power. There's power. And the glory. There's glory. The victory and the majesty. Those are additional ones. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is yours. And then listen, yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and your exalted is head over all. So here you have all the components that are found in the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. So we can pray this confidently as this prayer that God has given us. God is blessed forever and ever, and his power is the power and glory, and his is the kingdom. David even recognizes that it was God who had given him and the people a heart to serve God as God's people. So it all belongs to God. And that's what makes David confident. Remember I said he was in a transition time looking back at all that God had done and he's looking forward to what God has promised to do. That's a great way, position to be in when you're praying. In fact, we're always in that position, aren't we? We look back today at what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us and we look ahead to his promised coming. And so we have confidence as we look back and see how God has fulfilled his promises in the past. His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And we look forward to what he's promised to do because his is the kingdom and the power and the glory. He's going to do it in the future. That's what David is doing here. Looking forward, David knew that God had made even greater promises about the future of his kingdom. David had been promised that his son, a future son, would sit on God's throne forever. You know, that wasn't really Solomon, was it? I think it seems that David realized it wasn't Solomon, but he knew that God had made this promise for a great while to come, that his, this son would be an everlasting king who would be righteous and who would even abolish death for the kingdom, for his people. And because David could see that God's was the greatness and the power and the, and the kingdom and the glory, he was confident to pray to God as he looked to the future. So look at verses 18 and 19. 1 Chronicles 29, 18 and 19. O Lord God of Abraham. Okay, so he blessed God for the past. Now he's praying to God for the future. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our fathers, keep, the, keep this 
forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you and give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. So he's looking at the immediate thing that's before them of building the temple and he's praying with confidence because the kingdom and the power and the glory are God's and saying, God, you can even change the hearts of these people. You can keep it in their heart to do what you've called them to do. Because if you don't keep it in their heart, they probably won't do it. So he's looking to God and trusting God. Consider how each of these things then, as we consider them, kingdom, power, and glory, is able to give you confidence in your prayers. First, that God's is the kingdom. When David, understood, when David prayed this, he understood that God owned the kingdom. It is called the kingdom of God. He had made promises, God made promises, that he would make his kingdom of righteousness in this sinful world through the people of Israel. Because there was no kingdom of righteousness in this sinful fallen world. And God said he would make a kingdom of righteousness. We are fallen into sin. And God promised that he would put enmity in the hearts of the people that he called all the way back in Genesis 3, the seed of the woman. What is this enmity? It's a good enmity. Enmity is like a, a hatred for something, an en where you're an enemy. And he said, I'm going to make you enemies of the serpent that led you into rebellion. And then my kingdom is going to consist of people whose hearts, all, all of us following Satan, okay, after the fall, whose hearts are changed so that they have enmity now towards Satan and they want to follow devotionally. They, they have devotion to the living God. This, so this enmity would be a blessing. By it, God would deliver people from bondage to sin in order that they might serve God. And as David says in 1 Chronicles 29, God had given both David, the anointed king, and the people willing hearts to serve God and to look for his kingdom to come. God had promised to bring a son to David, as I already mentioned, that would reign on the throne of David forever. Even a king that would be David's Lord. David, of course, had uh, been given Psalm 110 as a prophecy. A, a, a king that would be David's Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. A king that would be a priest that would actually atone for the sins of his people, not after the order of Aaron, but another kind of priest after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, God would establish God's kingdom of righteousness. The king that was coming would establish God's kingdom of righteousness as a kingdom that would endure forever in which people would be fully reconciled to God forever and ever. So it was God's kingdom in this sense that God would establish it. But now we understand that the kingdom, we understand even more that it's God's kingdom. Because now Jesus has come. And Jesus is God. And that's a remarkable thing. When the promise was made to David, they didn't fully, fully understand all of that. But now Jesus, the Son of God, has come. And he himself, the person, Jesus Christ, is actually God's righteous kingdom in this sinful world. Because there's not one other person who is righteous. When John the Baptist came and he announced Jesus, he said the kingdom of God is at hand when Jesus was on the way. And then when Jesus came, the kingdom of God is here because Jesus was there. And for the first time ever since the fall, there was a righteous king on the earth ready to have a righteous kingdom. In a way, he already did have a righteous kingdom. But uh, it truly was there. Jesus came there not... not G Jesus was... There, there was not really a kingdom of righteousness, not, but Jesus was the, the kingdom of righteousness. And we're part of that glorious eternal kingdom that is blessed forever. We, come, we become part of it. How? When we come to Jesus... When we trust in Him, we're brought into union with Him, and then we're part of that kingdom of righteousness that Jesus established. So when we say, yours is the kingdom, now we really mean that. God's, God Himself 
has a kingdom. He became flesh and established this kingdom and we get to be part of it through faith. He takes care of everything from changing our hearts by His Spirit, which He's going to do in a total and complete way when we see Him at the end, we'll be like Him, and providing atonement for our sins, which He already did on the cross. That had not yet been done, you see, with David. So the kingdom, when David said this, the kingdom had not yet fully come in this way. David and the Old Testament people were part of the kingdom, but uh, it did not come except by way of promise to them until Jesus came. And then all those people that were waiting for the kingdom to come, then the kingdom of righteousness was established as a kingdom of righteousness. It was a kingdom of righteousness potentially before, but it didn't actually become a kingdom of righteousness until Jesus shed his blood and came into the world. And then we had this righteous king. So knowing that God's is the kingdom gives us tremendous encouragement. And we see all this. This is why Jesus was able to tell his disciples that now whatever they ask in his name would be granted to them. You have confidence in prayer because this is God's kingdom. He said that up until now, when he told them this, that they had not asked for anything in his name. But now they would do that and they would be heard. The kingdom is actually the kingdom of the Son of God and the Father always hears his Son. So when you make petitions in his name, God hears those petitions. Not that you can ask for some stupid thing, that you, whatever you want. You're just not asking in his name. It's when you're asking for things according to his will. So we know that if we're part of the kingdom, God will not turn away his son. He will bring all the blessings to that kingdom that he's promised. I mean, think about it. We're talking about things like perfect righteousness. We're talking about purity, holiness, where we love one another the way we should. He's going to accomplish all of that for this kingdom. Everything that he's promised. He's going to completely crush our enemies. Satan is going to be completely overthrown because this is God's kingdom. And we have confidence to pray that these things will be done. It's, it's the kingdom that belongs to the Son of God. And now, related to that, the power belongs to God. So that we say, yours is the power. God's is sovereign. God is sovereign. As we saw in the preface to the Lord's Prayer, He is in the heavens and does whatever He pleases. No one can stop God. His authority is unlimited. No one's going to get in His way. It's ultimately His plan that will be fulfilled. And we have the privilege of being tied to the fulfillment of that plan in our prayers. God wants us to want His purposes, His will to be done and to pray for it so that we might see His mighty hand as we cry out to Him and we see Him actually doing these things that we do not have the ability to do. He put His people in Egypt under bondage, helpless with the strongest kingdom in the whole world at that time, the most defiant Pharaoh who would not let them go, impossible for them to get away so that I might show everybody that I am Lord. So that His people crying out to Him in bondage that got worse when they first sought deliverance in order that they might see that it is God's power, that God's is the power and not them. We have to get that straight. God is teaching us that. And in our prayers, we pray to him as the one who has all power. And we learn of him as we do that. First Chronicles 29, we noted how David mentioned that God had given the people willing hearts to serve God. He said, Lord, the reason we're here today, where we are as a kingdom of God, is because you gave willing hearts to us. That's power. To be able to reach in and change someone's sinful, stubborn heart. We can pray then confidently that God will change people's hearts. When you see a cold heart for God, you see a cold heart in yourself for God. A cold heart toward your wife that you're supposed to love. Cold heart toward your husband. Cold heart toward your children. Cold heart toward your parents. Cold heart toward your siblings. Cold heart to God. Pray, because God's is a power, and he can change that. Instead of manipulating people, trying to manipulate circumstances, pray that God Almighty would exert his power. Paul says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. And that's true. Now, I'm serious about this. We really don't pray in faith about such things. Our prayers are hindered because we don't really expect God to do great things. 
Jesus talks about being able to move mountains if we have faith like mustard seed. See, people want to do things that are kind of like, you know, magic tricks or things like that. You know, like a guy will really want to go out and move a mountain or something. That's not the point. The point is transforming the lives of his people, changing their stubborn hearts, giving them a new life. This is the things we pray for. When we come to church, we don't look for him to work the way we should. We don't really look for him to work. We don't say, God, move in with power, with your almighty power. Show your mighty arm and reach out to your people and minister to them. We need to start doing that. When we evangelize, sometimes we don't even pray that people will actually be converted. We just pray that we'll have an opportunity to be a good witness to them, things like that. Those are fine things to pray, but pray that God will actually bring them to salvation because His is the power. Psalm 110 says that His people will be made willing in the day of His power. We don't know who God's elect people are, but wherever they are, doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what, they, they can be out like Paul killing all the Christians, blaspheming God. The power of God comes, they're done. <laughs> they're done with that old life. And by God's transforming power, they repent and come to Jesus Christ. We need to pray with confidence. And then finally, the, the glory belongs to God. We say in the prayer, we're taught to say by Jesus, yours is the glory. Now that's where the catechism began, wasn't it? Remember back in question one, it's talking about, you know, what is this all about? Like, what is life all about? What's the whole purpose of a human being? What's the chief end of man? A lot of people know the answer to that, even though they don't know our catechism. It's to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The very purpose of creation is to glorify God and to enjoy Him, to see His glory. That's what makes us really happy is when we see the glory of God. We can't be really satisfied until we see His glory. God made the heavens and the earth to display His wisdom and power and His kindness and justice and holiness and beauty and grace and love. We looked at all that, you know, how God's given us so many wonderful things in the original creation before the curse, and even now we have, you know, so many, like we talked about food, how we're able to have taste, so many different things. He didn't just give us some, some bland diet. We have the ability to taste and all sorts of things to taste. This is kindness, this is justice, this is wisdom. The way everything's ordered and the, the, all the uh, complexity of it. And, and, and what was the purpose of that? To bring glory to God. And then redemption. He saves sinners. They've fallen into sin. It was God's plan for all of it to happen. And then He saved us. Why? So that He could show His glory in redeeming us. Why does he save human beings who have rebelled against him, who have ruined themselves by corruption and sin? They deserve to go to hell. Absolutely. He does it for his glory, the glory of his grace. He sent his son for his glory. My brothers and sisters, when you come to truly know God's amazing love to us in Jesus Christ, when you see what a gracious God that he really is and how wrong you have been to believe Satan's lie that following God is not going to be a good thing, when you see what a pure and holy God He is who delights in the truth and in righteousness and yet who reaches out to sinners who are not righteous in mercy in order to save them, when you really begin to see what a wonderful, glorious God He is, then you want nothing more than to see Him glorified. That starts to become a desire that's deep in your heart. If you are sick, Your prayer is not mainly that you'll get well, but that you'll glorify God whether you're sick or well. It's an opportunity. If you're rich or you're poor, what do you want? To glorify God. I'm not saying that we're there, but as we grow in our knowledge of God, that's where we're going as He works in us. You pray that He'll be glorified. If you're honored or persecuted, not just, Lord, don't let me ever be persecuted, but Lord, let Your name be honored. You be glorified. His glory is what you yearn for, what you crave. You can't wait for Jesus to appear in all of His glory at the end of the age. You know that all the glory rightfully belongs to Him. All other glory is derived from Him. And so therefore, all glory belongs to Him. And you are glad when He is glorified, when you see His glory, and when other people see His glory. Then everything is put right. Until that happens, nothing has been yet put right in the way God says it will be. 
It's when you start to pray with confidence that He will be glorified. When you begin to see that, when you begin to have that desire, you see that He will be and that He ought to be, and that's when you start to pray. You pray that He will save His people, that He will conquer Satan, that He will change you and fill you with His fullness, that He will provide for you. You pray for all of these things in the Lord's Prayer, that we have all the requests there fervently, because you know that by answering these prayers, God will be glorified. And you know that God desires to be glorified, so you're confident to pray for the things that will bring glory to His name. The glory is all His. Do you see then how recognizing that His is the kingdom and the power and the glory gives you confidence in your prayers? Do you see how it stimulates your prayers? You're praying for what belongs to God and what He's committed to accomplish. So that gives you confidence. You want what God wants, and you know that He'll hear you when you ask for it. You say, well, if God's going to do it, why should I pray? You should pray because God has given you the privilege to be involved in bringing it about through your prayers and in seeing His hand as you're in Egypt and you're in bondage and you cry out and you see His mighty hand deliver you. You see the glory of God and you understand His power in ways that you wouldn't have seen it if you weren't in bondage. This is how God works. Okay, and so we desire these things we're sure of them, and in testimony of our desire to see these things and our assurance of these things that, that we will be heard, then we say amen. Now we're going to look at amen. Do you know what the word amen means? It's actually a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word that um, carries over in English to a certain extent. I and mean, we say the word amen. We know that word. The core idea, the root of the word amen is certainty. That which is sure. Now, it's translated by a whole lot of different English words. We use it exclusively just for the word amen as we use it in a very limited way. But the original word is much broader in meaning. So we have lots of English words in the Bible that translate the word amen. It's often used to describe God himself as being faithful and true. Both faithful and true are words that translate amen. For example, in Deuteronomy 32.4 it says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth, a God of amen, and without justice, righteous and upright is he. In Isaiah 49, 7, we read, the Lord who is faithful, the Lord who is amen. And in Psalm 89, we praise him for his faithfulness with, his, with this word as well. Psalm 89, 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness. Amen. Your amen to all generations. Things associated with God are also amen. His testimonies and precepts are said to be sure in Psalm 19.7. To be amen. They're reliable. They're trustworthy. They're true, you see. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 55.3 speaks of the covenant that God made with David as what? The sure mercies of David. The certain mercies. The amen mercies of David. God's people are also sometimes referred to as faithful or true. For example, the Lord says of Moses, Numbers 12, 7, Not so with my, my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. He's amen in all my house. Above all, Jesus Christ is amen. Revelation 3.14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So the core meaning is certain, sure, faithful. But of course, as you know, the word amen is also used, it has a liturgical function, something we do in worship. We're familiar with the Hebrew word being used in English in that way because we use it in English to close our prayers. We say amen at the end of our prayers. And it's used in a lot of other different languages as well besides English. It's here at the close of the Lord's Prayer, you see. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our Lord teaches us to use it at the end of our prayers. We find it in Old Testament worship by the whole congregation. For example, when the curses and blessings were pronounced, remember in Deuteronomy 27 when they were on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and they were 
uh, saying the blessing, the cursing, and so on, the people, when the people entered the promised land, they were supposed to respond to each one with amen. It's true, faithful. The saying is true, it's faithful, it's sure. They're saying it's so, truly. So they used it in that worship. It was used to express agreement when God's name was blessed. For example, in 1 Chronicles 16.36, the whole congregation used it. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. That was what was pronounced okay, by the, by the leader. And all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Okay, so be it. It's true. It's used in each of the benedictions that I mentioned that separate the five books into which the Psalms are divided. For example, in Psalm 41.13, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Certainly and certainly. Truly and truly. You know, be it so, be it so. <laughs> we also uh, use, see the word amen in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 14, 16, Paul speaks of the amen as the customary response of the congregation to prayers. Again, one person prays, and the other people receiving and hearing the prayer respond with amen. He asked how an uninformed person, he's talking about tongue speaking, can, come, can say amen to your prayers if you pray in a foreign tongue. They don't know what you're saying. So they can't say, that's true. That's faithful. That's so. He cannot express his acquiescence with your prayer if he doesn't understand. A few years ago, I encouraged you in our church, and we established the biblical practice in our worship service of saying amen to express assent to the prayers that have been prayed in the church. Sometimes we need to work on that a little bit, or you get a little weak with our amens. I'm told that sometimes in the early church that the people were afraid by the corporate amen of the congregation because it was so strong. People said, amen, at the closing of the prayers. Now, there, this, is a, this is an important thing. It's, a, an, it's a, something that we're to do corporately, not as individual expressions of worship. And that's where sometimes you'll be in a church and that people will be doing individual expressions. One person will say amen over here, another person will say something else over there and over there, and it's going all around. But when we worship, we're together corporately. And what we find in the scriptures is these corporate amens where at the end of a prayer, at the end of a blessing, all of God's people together say amen. Because we're here together as a body, not individually expressing ourselves, but corporately together we're, we're, we're coming before God. Now, but what are we doing when we say amen at the end of our prayer? So let, let's think about that for a minute. When it's a prayer in which we're asking God to do something, we're basically saying, may it be so. We're agreeing with what has been prayed and affirming that it is truly what we want. So that means you need to be alert if you're going to say amen at the end of the prayer. Don't just say it because you're taking God's name in vain if you just say it and you don't even know what was prayed. Just because it's time to say amen. Amen. You don't even know what it's about. That's not the idea. This is where you're, you're, you're attentive. It's a sobering thing. When you say amen, you're making a kind of a vow before God, affirming, Lord, we as a congregation have brought this before you. Amen, Lord. Receive. This is so. This is our desire. This is our desire as your people. So be careful that you don't uh, make mockery of his holy majesty when you come before him. And when it's a blessing upon God that has been spoken, rather than a request, we're basically saying that this is true, what has been said. This is what we say in part at the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer. Because having said, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. When we say amen, we're saying that's true. Okay? It's true that God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But having also, in the Lord's Prayer, lifted up the previous petitions, we're also affirming those petitions before God when we say amen. So we're saying, may all these prayers be so because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We're affirming as David did that because God has all sovereignty and all power and all glory that we're confident that he will do what we have requested in our prayers. It is a sure affirmation. 
So what a suitable way for, us, for the catechism to be brought to an end here. Having seen over the course of these 33 months all that the Lord has done for us. So we've gone through all the different things that He's done for us. And having seen all that He's called us to be, we conclude with instruction that we're to pray, that when we pray to Him, that we're to say, Lord, may all of these things be so. That by His sovereign grace and glorious power, we may see the fulfillment of all that He has called us to be as His people. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Truly and truly, may it be so. So, let's stand and pray to the Lord our God. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for all of the marvelous things that we have seen as we have done this study over the last 33 weeks or so. Father, we marvel that right from the beginning we saw that the whole of life is about bringing glory to you, bringing glory to you and enjoying you. And Father, we pray that that would be so. And Father, we see that we saw after that that you've given us your word to show us how to do that. And Father, we praise you for your word and we pray that you would use your word in our lives. And then, Lord, we began to see about your character. We began to see the things that are revealed about you and we began to see about how we were made by your hand and how you govern all things. And we saw how we rebelled against you and how we became undone and ruined by sin and sentenced to eternal condemnation and misery. And then we saw how you did not leave us to perish in our sin and misery, but that you sent forth a Redeemer. And we thank you that we were told of that Redeemer and of all that he has done for us, that he is the true Son of God who became flesh, and that by his hand and by his suffering that we are justified, that we're adopted, that we're sanctified, that we have the hope of the resurrection, of an eternal inheritance, that we have all of the promises of God in Him. And we thank You, Lord, that You have revealed all these things to us in Your Word. And Father, we praise You for what You have given us. Yours is the kingdom, Lord, that kingdom that You have promised us. Yours is the power, that power of the Holy Spirit that works in us and transforms us so that we can come to You willingly as Your people and so that we can continue willingly as your people. And Father, yours is the glory. All of this is done, that your name might be glorified and honored. And then, Lord, we looked at your holy commandments, at your law, and we saw how that you graciously gave them to us when you had redeemed us, not to be a way that we would be saved, but to be the way that we go when we are saved to be the way that you lead us into your family, that we might live for you and serve you in your house. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us guidance in this way. And we pray, Lord, that your will would be done, that we would obey all of your commandments, that we would delight in them, that we would love your law, that it would not be a burden to us, but it would be a delight to us to walk in the will of God and to do what is pleasing to you. Give us a heart for it, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord. And we also saw how that uh, you gave us the means of grace, Lord, and uh, faith and repentance that we might come to you and be connected to Christ and his kingdom, that we might not be outside looking at it, but that we might come and actually be joined to Christ by believing in him and, and turning away from our old life to walk with him. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you did. We thank you, Lord, that you also gave us the word, sacraments, and prayer and that we have been able to see how these are used in our life to connect us to Jesus Christ. Father, how we pray that we might see the Word and the sacraments and prayer working in your church today, working in us, Lord, bringing about all of those things that you have given to us as your people. Father, we bring all of these things before you, Lord. Hallowed be your name, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen.